When a man says, that's interesting, dear, what he means is, are you still talking? <laughs> Thanks, Pat, I appreciate this. <laughs> when a man says it's a guy thing, he means there is no rational thought pattern connected with this, and you have no chance of it making sense. When a man says, can I help with dinner? What he means is, why isn't dinner ready yet? When a man says, uh, uh, sure, honey, or yes, dear, he means absolutely nothing. It's a conditioned response. <laughs> when a man says, you know how bad my memory is, he means, I can remember the theme, so theme song to Gilligan's Island, his favorite lines from movies, and the make and model of every car he's owned. But yes, I forgot your birthday. When a man says, oh, don't fuss, I just cut myself, it's no big deal. He means, I probably severed a limb, but I, and, but I will bleed to death before I admit I'm hurt. When a man says, I heard you, he means, I haven't the foggiest clue what you said, and I'm hoping desperately that I can fake it well enough so that you'll not spend the next three days yelling at me. When a man says, you look terrific, he means, oh please, don't try on one more outfit. We're late and I'm starving. <laughs> when a man says, I'm not lost, I know exactly where we are, he means no one will ever see us again. <laughs> when a man says, I don't remember saying that, it's because he means anything I may have said six months ago is inadmissible in an argument. In fact, all past comments become null and void after seven days. When a man says, that's not what I meant, he means if something I said can be interpreted two ways and one of the ways makes you sad or angry, I meant the other. If, you, if your husband says, honey, what color is this? He means peach, for example, is a fruit, not a color. Pumpkin is also a fruit. And I have no idea what taupe is. Is that a word, taupe? Is that a color? Taupe, yes. Taupe? Yep. See, I have no idea what it is. I can't even say it. <laughs> so hopefully this will help some of you guys, some of you ladies, understand and get mad before he has a chance to say anything. <clears throat> you know, in this day and age in which we live and the struggles that we see going on around us, a lot of us might agree with what uh, the psalmist David said. In Psalms 12, verses 1 through 2, 1 and 2. And it says, Well, we were going to run your other video. The, videos, the other video is right at the end. The very last thing. Sorry, my, my bad. See, that's why we get the bugs worked out on Saturday night. So then Sunday it goes a lot smoother. Okay, David said this Help, O Lord, for the godly are fast disappearing. The faithful have vanished from the earth. Neighbors lie to each other, speaking with flattering lips and deceitful hearts. David was lamenting to the Lord and was actually crying out for help, saying, the godly are fast disappearing. And as you look at the events around us, you look at the world and what's happening, you've got to start wondering, God, where is, where is the godly? Where, what's going on here? You see the anger, you see the hurt, you see the, the words back and forth, everything that's going on, and, and you know, where's, where's godly men that are rising up? And how do you distinguish between a godly, how do you know a godly man? Because they're, they're not speaking what everybody else is speaking. They have an insight into what God is doing in this hour, and they're able to speak with a wisdom and a compassion that meets the situation. And David in his time was looking around and going, God, they're disappearing. Uh, we might could say that. God, where are the godly men in this hour? Now, that's not to say that there aren't godly men. There are. Just sometimes, where are they? What are they doing? Micah also said this. Micah, a prophet, at the end of the Old Testament said this. The godly people have all disappeared. Not one honest person is left on the earth. They are murderers, setting traps, and even for their own brothers. Both their hands are equally skilled at doing evil. Both their hands are skill, equally skilled at doing evil. Officials and judges alike demand bribes. The people with influence get what they want, and together they scheme to twist justice. 
I mean, doesn't that sound like today? Yes. They scheme together to twist justice. The, those in influence are, are twisting things to get what they want, to get the direction they want. Um, you know, and it's not for the will of the people. It's not always even in the best interest of the people. It's in the best interest of them. And so we see this, and it can become disheartening. But as we celebrate Father's Day and as we look at godly men, the Bible gives us a description and gives us characteristics to, for us as men to, to aspire to and to want to become. And so I just want to share a couple of those uh, with you. In fact, Micah 6.8 says this. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. In, in other words, he has shown you the right way. He has shown you what is a godly man, what a godly man looks like. And what does the Lord require of you? What does the God expect out of us as men? He says, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So Micah the prophet is telling them and what, what we're looking for. Later on in chapter 7, he says, where are they all gone? They've disappeared. We, they can't be found. And so as we look at this verse and it talks about uh, what we are to be like, I just want to break it down and talk about a few points. The godly man is intentional that he has set his heart to do what uh, is godly. And he knows that he is an example to all who are watching him. You know, if, if there's a characteristic that has been probably in the last little bit, probably 10, 15 years, but we have seen even more in the last few months in this, in this period of isolation, is people withdrawing, people getting out of the fight. You know, it, it's hard to engage in conversation anymore. You, you never know who you're talking to, what their, what their position is going to be, and there's so much animosity towards the opposite position that if you just mention, I, I was having a conversation, and I just wanted to feel this out a little bit. Um, I, I was talking to a salesperson, and, and we were looking at buying this thing, and, and, uh, and so in the course of a conversation, we had been doing some kidding back and forth and, and bantering, and, and I figure if he's trying to sell me something, then I have, he has my, uh, my attention, or I've got his attention, because he's trying to sell me something, and so I like to make, I like to pick fun a little bit, and, and prolong the process, just that good nature not anything mean-spirited. And so as we were bantering back and forth, I thought, you know, I'm just going to find out, you know, where, where he lines up. I said, so, uh, you know, just kind of change the subject. Uh, how, do you, how, do you feel the how do you feel about the job the president's doing? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> he was not make it great again, okay? <laughs> and, and there, but there was such animosity, such, such anger that came out, and it's like, ooh, I'm not going to touch that, I'm just, and he didn't, he didn't ask me, and I didn't, I let it go at that point, and just, but that's where we are today, it's like, if you hold any contrary opinion, it's like, there's such animosity, there's such, and a godly man knows that he is to be a model, that to, to knows what he needs to stand up for, and knows what's right, and knows, and I'm not, I'm not trying to get into, this isn't political speech, this is just, that in, in a time when so many people are tending to hide and to shrink back, that a godly man knows that part of his purpose is to be an example and to be a model of what a godly man looks like. The first thing, the godly man, one of the first characteristics is a godly man has surrendered control of his life to God and is living, hum, living humbly before his God. Psalms 19 says this. Who can understand his errors? This is David. Cleanse me, cleanse me from secret faults. See, a godly man knows who he is. He knows that he's not perfect. He knows he doesn't have it all figured out. And he knows who he is before God. And that is a broken, sinful man. That he knows that there's areas in him that isn't perfect. You know, and too often that... that <laughs> For lack of better words, we put on a show. We try to look the part. But a true godly man knows who he is before God. Who can understand, David says, who can understand a man's ways? Who can understand his faults, his mistakes? You know, we can be deceived. We can deceive ourselves. 
And we can think we're better than we are or we're doing better. And then the Lord spot sends a spotlight on our hearts and it's like, oh man, that is so bad. That is so wicked. You know, and sometimes I, I want to be loving. I want to be kind to people. But every once in a while, there's this ugliness that just comes out. I know it's, I'm probably disappointing. You think I'm perfect and do everything right. But it disappoints me. And I look and I go, God, how can, how can I know my error? How can I know my way? God, I am broken before you. Cleanse me of my secret faults. Cleanse me of those errors. God, first of all, just, I don't even know what they are, but cleanse me. But help me to know. Keep track, your servant, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over, let them not control me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. And then he closes with this, and this is really the heart of a godly man. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now, let the words of my mouth, if, you're, if words are coming out of your mouth, the people in your shot can hear those words and go, did he just say that? Oh my God. He's not supposed to say that. Oh. We, can we can reveal ourselves by the words that come out of our mouths. And sometimes we don't set a very good example. But you know what? He went beyond the words. He said, let the meditation of my heart. What you think about, the thoughts that go through your mind, only you and the Lord see those. People can't see those. They don't know what's going on inside of you. But a godly man knows that he's living before the Lord. And in Micah it says that we would walk humbly before our God. That we would recognize who we are before him. And, and even though, yes, I'm talking to godly men, this, this applies to mankind, to all of us. That we have a responsibility of how we live our lives. That God sees the very heart, the very intent of, of our motives, of why we do. And we can clean up our speech. We can say the right things and do the right things, but inside our heart, it's condemning them or, or thinking all manner of evil and wanting to exact revenge. But we're smiling and we're saying the right thing. But God sees. And the godly man or the godly person knows that God looks on the heart and he sees it all. And that we don't try to hide. We don't try to deceive ourselves into thinking that maybe we're really better than we are. And there's maturity, there's growth, and it should be celebrated, and, and, but, but there's still those areas. And, and I'm pretty sure from the time we get saved to the time we die, it'll be a continual growing, learning, maturing process of our hearts being revealed. But David just was straight out, God, keep me from presumptuous sins. Let the words of my mouth, let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. That the godly man is desiring to walk in relationship with his God. It, it encompasses salvation. It encompasses a good heart and a growing heart and wanting to be teachable and wanting to be learned, to, to grow and to learn and to mature. The godly man has surrendered control of his life and is living humbly before. See, to live humbly... Humbly, being humble isn't thinking less of yourself. How we get to a position of humility is understanding who we are in relation to who God is. Because if I, can, if I look around, I can always find people that are worse than I am or doing worse behaviors, and I can think, eh, I'm not so bad. I'm doing pretty good. But when I w look up, and I measure by the holiness of his standard, it's God, who am I? And it brings me to my knees. It brings about a humility. It brings about a place of living before him, of God, I need you. I need you. And I can't do anything without you. Lord, I need you to cleanse me. I need you to heal me. I need you to weed out these secret things. And listen, God does it, but we don't like how he does it. How he does it is he allows circumstances in your life that start squeezing you and putting pressure on you and then all of a sudden, we throw up what's inside. 
and all of a sudden attitudes and things begin to, to swell up or you walk around with a bad attitude or you know you're angry or mad and, and it's like there's really no reason to be mad other than life is squeezing you and it's revealing stuff on the inside and it's at those points that we are to come back to him and God I need you Lord, I want to walk humbly before you, and I want to walk in humility before you. God, cleanse my way. Heal my heart. Psalms. Moving on. The godly man is becoming a man of integrity. That his words and his actions, his thoughts and his actions are beginning to line up so that there's not this hypocrisy of a living life one way but secretly on the inside or you get behind closed doors or you get out of town away from people that know you and, and know you're a Christian and then different behaviors come out. That, that as we're growing and walking humbly before God, it's about a person becoming a man of integrity. That words and actions and thoughts all begin to line up and, and to want. Now, we're not perfect and we have a long way to go, but that's not an excuse. We can't use that as an excuse of, well, you know, God is still in the process and, and we need to be trying. We need to be working with him in these areas. Second of all, the godly man takes care of his responsibilities. Ephesians 5, first of all, he loves his wife. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 says this, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now Paul is making a comparison. And he's telling husbands, husbands, you need to be intimately acquainted with your wife, just as Christ is with the church. Now, in this day and age, when you hear the word intimate, usually everybody's mind jumps to the physical sense of intimacy. But we need to know and men need to understand that emotional intimacy is far more important and, and crucial to the relationship than physical intimacy. I talk to a lot of young people that have engaged in sexual activity and they're in love and they want to get married and it's three months later they're broken up and they're devastated and how could this be? And, and I always ask them, have you, were you participating? Had you been intimate? And yes, I just don't understand why and, and, or why he broke up and why that. that. And it's like, y y you don't get it. You guys jumped right into bed, which creates a, a picture of intimacy with there never being any intimacy. You just physically come together. But emotional intimacy, you have to grow first in emotional and connection. How do you grow in connection emotionally? Is by sharing who you are, sharing the deep secrets of what's going on in your life, your aspirations, your dreams, your fears, and being able to communicate to somebody that isn't going to judge you that isn't going to condemn you, that isn't going to laugh at you, or, oh, could you be that? But you grow together in sharing your dreams and your purposes, and as two lives are becoming one, and two lives be coming together, sharing dreams and hopes and fears and sins and, and all the stuff that goes along with life, it begins to build an intimacy that as you progress and you find, hey, I shared my deepest, darkest secrets, and they didn't run off. This one might be a keeper. And as you grow in love, then the culmination is physical intimacy. And it is so much sweeter and greater physical intimacy after having achieved emotional intimacy than just two teenagers in lust jumping in bed together. And it destroys the relationship because it gives you a picture of intimacy or the feeling of intimacy without there being any intimacy. And so after a while, the relationship crumbles because they never really got to know each other. Or worse, they get married and two years later they're divorcing because they never really knew each other. And so in this area of husbands loving your wives, it is about getting to know them. 
sharing your heart with them. And Paul gives the example of Christ who gave himself for the church, that he might sanctify him, the, the church and cleanse her with the washing of water, that there's a giving of, of a responsibility that Christ has over his church where he is working with the church to bring her to a place that is glorious, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And husbands, loving your wives is about helping them to become the person that God intended them to be, helping them to grow and to mature, and that God has given you a certain amount of responsibility. Now, not the sole responsibility, but we play a part in helping them to grow and to develop into who? And the sad part is, is we're going to stand before God, and God is going to go, I gave you her. Is she better off having been with you? Did you help her grow and become the person that I created her to be? I gave her to you so that you could represent me in helping her to grow. And too many men are still too selfish to look beyond their own needs and what they want and aren't really worried about making sure that she's growing and she's developing. That adds, God has given us a hierarchy responsibility. And husbands, when it talks about loving your wives, it just doesn't mean that you stay with them or provide for them. It's if you're not opening up, if you're not sharing who you are, what your struggles are, you're slowly growing apart. And I don't know what's worse. Divorce or two people that live under the same house that are just two individuals that they, never, they stop growing together and they've just become two people doing their own things, living under the same roof and calling it a marriage. Husbands are godly men, love their wives. They also love their children. Proverbs 22.6 says this, as a familiar, train up the child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Also, Ephesians 6, 4 says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. To love your children, to train them up in the way they should go, is not just to beat them into submission. It is to understand their bent, understand who God created them to be, and help them to grow in relationship, which means fathers and godly men need to get involved with their children. They need to listen to what they're saying. Listen to the words that are coming out of their mouth and not judge it, not criticize it or discipline it, but sometimes find out why they feel that way, why they're thinking that way. It's an investment of your life into theirs. And you're wanting to train them up in the way that they should go means that you've got, to, you've got to get before God and have God eyes and understanding who God made them to be. Because I, th there's always this danger as a parent. You want them to be the best. You want them to excel and do great things. But you, want them, you usually want them to do that in the image that you have for them. And sometimes that isn't the image that they have for themselves or even the gifting that God gave them. And so oftentimes loving our children is being able to back off, understand who they are, and help them to grow into maturity as, as a godly person. And you do, we do that by modeling what a godly man looks like, being a godly person. Um, I thought of something and it just fluttered away. Let me see if I can get it back. No. Okay, Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, we have the responsibility. Men, we have the responsibility to bring up our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, that, to train them. Oh, some, this, it came back. The best advice I ever heard about parenting is oftentimes you ask parents, what do they want for their kids? I want them to be good kids. And that's, that's an okay goal, but it's not the best goal. The best goal is we want our kids to be responsible adults. And to grow them up to be responsible adults is more than just making them to be good kids. Because you can make them be good kids until they're 18 years old. And then they get outside of your house and all of a sudden they're out from underneath your rule and your authority and they never learned how to make choices or the consequences for their own choices. And so they go haywire trying everything and doing everything because they, they never got a, a chance to grow and develop in making choices and decisions. 
And so as parents, as fathers, we got to know how to raise up our children, how to, and even as adults, when they become adults, how to continually encourage them and help them and who God created them to be. And even if sometimes they're doing things that, that are going places that you wouldn't want to see them go, but you've got to encourage them. Uh, I'll never forget talking with Aaron and Rhonda Fitzgerald. Most of you know they, they attended here. Uh, they moved in 2014. But their son, Cody Adams, uh, began to have inklings of wanting to be a missionary. And it was hard. They didn't want to let go. They did not, especially when he started talking about he wanted to go uh, overseas and go to Turkey. And it's like all the fears, all the things come up in your mind. And they had to get to a place of, God, we turn them over to you. We surrender and be a source of encouragement. Because for a while, and the thought process is going on, uh, and they would come and talk to me, they were really negative. And they were having a hard time thinking, how could, their, how could they let their son go do this? And it was like, it's not your choice. And our role is now to support them in. And that can be very hard for parents. It can be very hard to let go and have them become responsible adults. So loving your child is once they get to that point of being uh, responsible for their own decision, decisions, is, is helping them and being there and encouraging them and supporting them uh, in what they're about to do. Training them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord is that we have to model what a godly man looks like so they have an image uh, of what they're shooting for. And lastly, uh, a godly man works hard to provide for the needs of his family. Actually, that's not the last thing, but we're getting close. He works hard to provide for the needs of his family. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says... And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the, uh, of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Lord, Lord Christ. That what we do, we have to understand we're not working for a boss, we're not working for our parents, we're working for God. And again, we're modeling what a godly man looks like and, and somebody that works hard and, and uh, provides food for his family, takes care of his family. And, and the disturbing trend that you see among young people is at 24, 25, 26, 28, they're still living at home, maybe have a part-time job, but they're still engrossed in video games. That they're not learning how to apply a work ethic and to how to develop a work ethic. That, you know, sometimes once you get out of mom and dad's and, and you're responsible for your own life, life gets hard. When it's on you to pay the bills and to pay the rent and to figure out what's going to happen and, and all that. Yeah, I wish I could have stayed at my mom's house until I was 40 and, and let her take all the responsibility. I just couldn't get Susan to go along with that. <laughs> but it, it's hard. And all of a sudden you're faced with the choices and the decisions, but being a godly man is you take responsibility. You take responsibility for your life and, and how the direction that your life is going to go. And it's not easy, and it's not fun, and it's not hard. And there are times that we actually have to say no to ourselves. That no, I can't get that. No, I can't spend the money on me. That the kids need shoes, or the, the and and unfortunately, we're, we're you look in society, and I'm gonna say this as delicately as kindly as I can. You, we see a bunch of spoiled, entitled kids, and they expect everything to be handed to them. That's kind of why it's been so easy for the younger generation to adopt a philosophy of socialism. Because they want everything handed to them. They don't want to have to work for it. And they don't care who pays the bill. So, okay, I'll get off my soapbox now. Being responsible is about, ta being, being a godly man is about taking responsibility for our lives. And lastly, a godly man uses his strength to defend against injustice. Matthew 5, for Matthew in the Beatitudes, it talks about this. It says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. These are all attitudes that are supposed to be ingrained in the godly person. But those who mourn, this isn't grieving over uh, just the loss of a loved one. The, that word mourn, or, or blessed are they that mourn, they're grieving over the impact of sin on the world around them. 
A man does not withdraw, does not hide from it. A, a godly man embraces the world around them and the injustices that are happening because of sin, and it grieves him. His heart's moved. You know, it's real easy to look at the events on TV and go, eh, no big deal. You know, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. This is someone that, because they're grieved, because they're grieved over what they see happening, God, we got to see you move. Their hunger for more of God in their life to be more of a catalyst in making social change. It just doesn't mean I'm hungry for more of God and, and his righteousness in my life. We need to do that because that puts us in a position, but it's also hungering and thirsting for righteousness in the world around us. That right actions and righteousness are, is, is happening in the court decisions, in the politicians' decisions, in the world around us, that we're striving to see more righteousness happening in our lives. And then blessed are the merciful. It's being able to be kind and compassionate to those that are hurting. It's easy to, in whatever station of life we find ourselves, to look down or to ignore or pretend it's not there to anybody that is lesser than, has less than that. And, you know, uh, I, I'll, I'll admit, I worked at the welfare department in another lifetime many years ago, and it made me very hard towards people that are on welfare because I saw all of the abuses, I saw all the things that were not, and so uh, my heart is very hardened, and I have to be very careful that I allow God's mercy, because I can just, you did this to yourselves, you're on your own. And that is not the Christian response. And, and it's something I have to continually come before God and say, God, I, it doesn't matter how they got there, they're in need. Now, it doesn't mean you have to help everybody and spend all your money doing that, but we need to be, be merciful and compassionate towards those that are less fortunate and be sensitive to God when God asks us to help and to give. So a godly man demonstrates he grieves over the, the loss of what we see around us. The, he hungers for more of righteousness, and he's, and he's merciful. James 1.27 says, Pure and undefiled religion is... Let me try that again. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That being a godly man, you recognize where the need is. The orphans, the widows that were moved with compassion. And I am so very grateful for so many in our church that have become foster parents, have adopted kids, that we have uh, two or three or four families that uh, have engaged in this. And, and you're practicing religion. It's exactly what God intended. We have to be sensitive and care about those that are less fortunate and not allow our hearts to become hardened. That is practice. That is the outward practice of all the other stuff is that we care about those around us and we practice our religion and display our religion by taking care of the needs uh, of those that are struggling. A godly man. A godly man walks humbly. A godly man takes care of responsibility, loves his wife, loves his children, provides for his family, and a godly man works to use his strength to alleviate and help in the injustices of this world. Dads, we salute you. We honor you for the hard work that you do, the giving of yourselves. Uh, we have a lot of great godly men in this church, and I'm very grateful. Uh, I want to show one last video. Happy Father's Day, neighbor. Happy Father's Day. Yeah, it's a uh, family tradition. Wear your Father's Day gifts all day. You wore that to church this morning? Indeed I did. Yeah, it was cute when they were kids, and now they're just trying to humiliate me. Get out. I wish I could. But humiliation is their love language. So, how about you? My teenage daughter got me a coupon for a mani-pedi. I love a good mani-pedi. No, you don't get it. She wants me to take her to get a mani-pedi so I can pay for the mani-pedi. Hmm. Can you take that baby tie off, please? That, that's what's bothering you about this ensemble? I just can't talk to you with it on. Okay. How about your boy? 
He got me a Love Me Tender trout. Fish me tender. Fish me sweet. Never let me go. Well, those sound like good gifts. Do they? You did not go to church dressed like this today. Yeah, I guess. Hey, listen. As fathers, we try to provide. We communicate with grunts more than we do words. We leave the toilet seat up as a conscious act of rebellion. And we don't complain about our Father's Day gifts. That's a father's lot in life, my friend. It's not the gifts. It's, it's really not the gifts. See this? My daughter gave this to me for Father's Day when she was five years old. She said to my wife, Mommy, I need to get Daddy the best gift ever because he's the best dad ever. She even wrote here on the tag, Happy Father's Day. She cuddled with this thing every night until she gave it to me. I was this little girl's whole world. One year they're getting you chair stuffed animals and then in the blink of an eye, it's pedicures and fish. They just grow up so fast. I just want to know that my role as a father matters before it's too late. I am going to get that fish a reservation to Heartbreak Hotel. Our pastor this morning at church said, um, Scripture, a child's glory is their father. It sums it up. That's all I want to be. I just want to make my kids proud, encourage them. Just be the man God called me to be. Hey, Dad. <laughs> Duty calls. Hey. You are your kid's glory. Your daughter, she's not looking for a freebie. She's saying she wants to spend time with you. And your son, he thinks you have a good sense of humor. I am pretty sure that your kids still think you're the greatest dad ever. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Hashtag dads are awesome. Hashtag dads are awesome. But fathers, we thank you and honor you for all of the things that you do. And so we just want to pray over you. God, we just thank you for these men. Father, I, I know their hearts are to serve you and to be a godly man. And Father, sometimes I know the struggles of leading a family, of, of trying to discern your will and what you have for them, uh, it sometimes is cloudy and, and hard and difficult. But Lord, I thank you for your grace. And Lord, I ask for your grace upon them as men, as fathers, as grandfathers. God, that they would continue to, to pour into their families and to give and to model what a godly man looks like. God, I pray your blessing upon them. Father, I pray for a great time of spending with their families this weekend, and we give you all the glory and honor and praise. In your name we pray. Amen.